pray today that you will say or that you can say to yourself that you are looking forward to that glad reunion day. Amen. Because if you are a child of God, you've got that promise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Apostle Paul said that we shall all be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yes. Amen. No more goodbyes. No more so longs. Just a continuous reunion day. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's so good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. Visitors, we welcome you. We have a favor to ask of you. I hope that you got a program, a bulletin when you came in. Uh, if you did, please fill out that little visitor section and give it to one of the ushers or put it in the offering receptacle as you leave out this morning. We'd appreciate that. Amen. We do welcome you as visitors. We welcome our church family. We welcome those that are viewing us by electronic means as well. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to once again be in your house. An opportunity to sing songs of praise. An opportunity to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. An opportunity, Lord, to present our request to you in prayer. An opportunity to uh, look to your word and see what you say to us. Father, we thank you for this time of worship that we have. We pray that our worship will be acceptable to you today, that you will be honored by everything that's said, everything that is done, by every thought that is had. May you receive glory, power, and honor. Bless us in this time that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask it. Amen. 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 For Jimmy. Well, good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. I am so glad that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was buried, and I'm extra glad he rose again. Amen. Amen. That separates those religions right. from us, mm -hmm. that we have a Savior. Yes. It's not only for that part about which we're singing that song about that glad reunion day, but it's for today, too. That's right. That uh, because he lives, <laughs> anything that comes our way, he's right there with us. Yes. Amen. Bill Gaither wrote a song that's become real popular. Just about everybody's recorded, I guess. Uh, it's called Because He Lives. You probably know it by heart, don't you? It's page 449 of the Baptist hymnal. Stand up. We'll sing all three stanzas, Because He Lives, 449.
say if you're going to children's church, meet Pam and Tina in the back. They done gone. <laughs> but I noticed something that just kind of tickled me. It was kind of like a stampede of them young ones right about this morning. Hey, man, that's good. And we got another little girl going to come and sing this morning. Always blesses our hearts. Yes. And our favorite little Native American comes and sings. <laughs> little Chickasaw. <laughs> Not a Choctaw now. It's a Chickasaw. Don't make that mistake. I did one time. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. <laughs> hey, she blesses my heart. She blesses everybody's yes. heart. Yes. What the come on to sing this song? Joy comes in the morning. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
We are so blessed here at Midway. Uh, a small church, but God has placed some mighty big talent in this church. Amen. All for his glory and for his honor. Amen. Jim, <clears throat> I got to thinking about something you said as you were introducing Watha about uh, her Indian heritage, ancestry, I should say. And I don't know what, but my mind just drifted back to when we were just youngins. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we'd love to go to the Saturday, Saturday movies. And it would cost us 10 cents to get in. I believe it's what we had to pay. And invariably, the movies were always about cowboys and Indians. <laughs> and uh, I, now I say this respectfully because I've got some Indian ancestry myself. Uh, the thing that, that, that I always dreaded to see was the poor white man getting scalped. <laughs> and I got to thinking about you said you paid the price and I noticed your forehead was going back this, and the hairline was going back just a little bit here well I think you didn't do anything then did you <laughs> alright enough of that <clears throat> go with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew Matthew chapter 5 and this is going to be the second message in a series of messages dealing with difficult things, difficult sayings, hard sayings. I hope you get my drift. We're going to be dealing with some tough things that Jesus spake. And I told someone this morning, as a matter of fact, I told a couple of different people, I think, this morning, that of all the series that I can recall, at least in the most recent past, <clears throat> that I have felt led to share with you, I've wrestled with this one probably as much as I have any of the series that I've shared with you. And the reason for that, I believe, is simply because of the subject matter that we're dealing with. I mean, something can't be difficult if it's easy. Two of you agree with me. Right. Something cannot be hard if it's soft. <clears throat> Something can't be rough if it's smooth. One person agrees with me. I guess I need to put me a mirror up here and just preach to myself. <clears throat> I guess this is the reason why it's been difficult. Because it is a difficult subject to deal with. But we can't back away from it. No. We can't. We've got to try to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. And keep in mind that the scripture bears record for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divine son of soul and spirits, and joints no more, and is a discerner of the faults and the intents of the heart. All adds to why it, this may be difficult. We're looking in Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> and we're looking at some things that Jesus says in what is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. We're only going to read a portion of what was recorded. Matthew 5, starting at verse 38. Jesus is speaking. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Now we're going to read a few more verses, but would you agree with me? Those are tough things. Amen. 
Those are difficult things. Yes, they are. Let's read on. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use, use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who loved you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is reading from the New King James Version. Would you agree with me? Those are some difficult sayings. Amen. Those are some difficult things to accomplish. Amen. Those are rough. Those are tough. This is the reason why I believe I have struggled so much with this series. Trying to find the correct application of what my Lord taught the disciples so nearly 2,000 years ago on the mount and what has been passed down, preserved, and given to us by God that would be applicable to us as well. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Even, Lord, when we have difficulty comprehending it, we pray this morning for insight. We pray this morning for understanding that we might see the things that you would have us to see, hear the things that you would have us to hear, understand the things you would have us to understand, that our lives will be Condition that our lives be brought more in conformity with what you would have us to be as your children. Father, bless each person that's here today. If by some chance there's someone in this congregation today that's not a Christian, may your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts that they might see their need of accepting Jesus and that they do it this very day. And I pray not for just these that are here but for those that are viewing and watching this program. Father, may those that are doing so that are lost kneel this very day and ask Jesus to be their Savior as well. Lord, give the recall of the message and leadership of it, the recall of thy word, the leadership of it, that you might be magnified, glorified, and honored. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and I ask it. Amen. 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 <clears throat> It's my intent in this series of messages to share with you some of the applications from this difficult passage of Scripture. But before I get, begin that, I want to do, as Brother Doc refers to it, a flyover of where we're already been and just capture a little bit of understanding leading up to where we are at. If you were to look, as I've said earlier already, <clears throat> Jesus is teaching his disciples a large multitude of people on the mountain. He's giving them a sermon. He's giving them a teaching. It has been said that this sermon on the mount is the longest recorded sermon teaching in the scriptures by Jesus. Very lengthily, it has been said. The audience is primarily made up of those that are following Jesus, those that are disciples of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount, it has been referred to, called the Constitution of Believers. Teachings by Jesus on how Christian people should behave themselves. It has been said that it is also the Christian's room of attitudes. 
We've looked at what some others have said about this interpretation, about how some believe that this passage, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is sharing with us, explaining to us the way some things are going to be in the millennium reign, the thousand year reign of Christ. There's some that had the idea, perhaps, that some of the teachings in this Sermon on the Mount are presented to let us see why we so desperately need a Savior. Because we are unable to accomplish all of these teachings that are here. And if we are unable to accomplish uh, the teachings of Christ, if we're unable to accomplish it, the teachings of God, how are we going to be reconciled to God? So some believe, and I tend to agree with this, that this Sermon on the Mount, perhaps even more specifically the scripture we've read in our hearing this morning, that, that's showing me even more why I need a Savior. Why I need Jesus. Because within my flesh, I cannot do these things. And you know, I don't mean to put you in a boat with me. I don't mean to imply to you that I think that you're just as bad off as I am. But I don't believe there is a person amongst us this morning that can say, oh, I can do that. No, I don't believe there is. So we've looked at that. And uh, I, I share with you this little story that hopefully makes an impact upon these difficult teachings. Uh, a pastor was teaching in a class and he was teaching on these very same scriptures that we've read. And as he concluded these teachings, uh, he asked his class, do you understand what I've said? And one boy says, I'm not sure I understand these difficult teachings. <laughs> Another boy says, well, let me tell you why they're difficult for me. It's not because I don't. It's because I think I do. And I'm not so sure I want to do them. For whatever the reason was and is, these are difficult sayings. And if it doesn't register with you as such, I challenge you to read these, take these in, digest these, and see if you hold the same opinion that they're not difficult. All right, do that. Okay, remember one other thing that I shared with you, and I'm, I'm, you know, I said I was going to do a flyover, not a landing. Uh, <clears throat> One other thing I want to point out to you is that even in the day that the Son of God presented these teachings, Jesus, God's only begotten Son, that just a short time after this, some of these disciples, some of these followers, they said to him, these things are hard. Yes. These things, paraphrasing, are difficult. And the scripture says they turned and quit following Jesus. It, it reminded me of a little story I heard about a revival meeting. Church had been going through some difficult days. People were just not as excited. People were just not enthused. People were just not as active in the church as they needed to be. And the pastor said, it's time for revival meeting. And so they brought in a well-known evangelist and he preached all that week. And at the end of the week, the pastor was out on a Saturday and was having coffee with some other pastors like it was a typical Saturday for him. And one of the pastors spoke up and said, well, how good was the revival meeting? He said, it was wonderful. It was great. The other pastor said, well, how many new converts did you get? And the pastor said, none. 
He said, wait a minute, you said it was good. It was. Well, how many other Christians joined your fellowship? He said, none. He said, I don't understand how you can interpret. It was a good revival meeting when you didn't have any converts, you didn't get any members, near members. How many folks got healed? None. He said, now you've really got me. How can you say that was a good revival meeting? He said, because we chased away about 10 of them. <laughs> you see, difficult things can either draw you or drive you. I'm hoping we don't lose 10 of you by the time we get through with this. But we need to understand that there is instruction in the Word of God that as Christian people, we need to embrace that instruction and we need to carry out that instruction. Amen. So let's just go further and let's just see what is being said here and what the application of what's being said. Uh, I, I want to give you a quote from a uh, from, uh, uh, J.W. Moore, you know, he's that good Methodist preacher I told you about. J.W. Moore, I want to give you a few quotes from him. He says, uh, these sayings are in response to harshness with kindness. A saying that may be harsh, but there is kindness included. These sayings are a response to cruelty with tenderness. These sayings are response to hurt by forgiving. These sayings are response to adversity by perseverance. These sayings are a response to hate with love. I thought that was mighty, mighty good. Yep. Yep. And some may say, did Jesus really mean these things? <laughs> Did Jesus mean what he said? Have you ever been enjoying in a conversation, maybe with your significant other, or maybe parent to child, or maybe boss to employee, and something is said, and one looks at the other and says, do you really mean that? Well, if you're married, you've heard that. <laughs> and more likely, you, if you're an employee, you've heard that. Or if you're the employer, you've said that or heard it said. Did Jesus mean what he said? Hey, Jesus is quite different from many of us. So, sometimes sometimes I, I, I have to catch myself and say, now, Jerome, is that something the Lord wants you to say or is that something you wanted to say? You know, sometimes even in conversation, not necessarily spiritual wise, but just in conversation, we will open up and spout off without really thinking. Boy, I don't feel like I'm getting any love this morning. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah, sometimes we do that. But listen, Jesus never did that. He said what he meant and he meant what he said. Amen. Hey, listen, it's not a matter of Jesus saying it and you believing it, making it right. Jesus said it. That makes it right. Amen. We hope you and I believe it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That'll preach. So if Jesus meant these things, let's look at them a little closer. I'm just going to probably only look at one thing this morning that he said. It'd probably be enough to make a squirm and fidget and... You know, you never can tell. Let's go back and let's look at verse 39. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slapped you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Many of you know that several of us that preach, teach here at the church and even some of the general membership were fond of the series Through the Bible by, by J. Vernon McGee. 
And so I'm researching, trying to see what others might have said about this. And I've come across this little story J. Vernon McGee shared that some may use as an interpretation of verse 39. J. Vernon McGee said there was this Irishman. And y'all know what Irishmen are known for, right? You don't? It's not their funny way of talking. They like to fight. <laughs> I'm not saying it will work. But anyway, this one Irishman is talking to this other Irishman. And apparently this one Irishman, we'll call Irishman number one, said something to Irishman number two that upset Irishman number two. And Irishman number two co-cocked him. I mean, just knocked the living fire out of him. Sent him tumbling backwards. He got up and he came back up to Irishman number two. And he just turned his cheek like this and said, do it again. He obliged him. <laughs> back off he went. This time he got up and he just whooped the fire out of Irishman number two. Someone said, why did you do what you did? Don't you know the Lord says, turn the other cheek? He said, I did. He said, but the Lord didn't tell me what to do after I turned that second cheek. <laughs> now some would like to take an interpretation like that of this passage of scripture. But what does the Lord really want us to garner from this turn the other cheek? I'm going to give you some thoughts. And I, I'm just about through, so don't worry, okay? I'm going to give you some thoughts. Here's what it means. It means don't return hurt for hurt. Don't return hurt for hurt. Now, I, 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 I pondered whether I needed to preclude these thoughts by sharing with you something that I'm not even sure I pronounce it correctly. You know, we had a wedding here at the church yesterday. It was the first one in my 47 years of ministry that I had an interpreter because there was a great number of Spanish-speaking people here that couldn't speak English. I've been told that I need an interpreter even when I'm talking to English-speaking people. But uh, that wasn't the reason for it. Uh, sometimes some of these words, uh, they get difficult for me to pronounce. You know, I didn't come up in the age of phonics. I've come up in the age of trying to remember how to spell something. But there, there's a word. It's, uh, I believe, uh, hat. Purpley. Hyperbole. I've got it written down phonically up here. Hyperbole. You know what that means? You don't. It means it's an overstatement for the sake of emphasis. It is an intensified, amplified, lay it on thick, enhanced, mighty way of trying to make a point. It's an expression used to make a point. For example, here's some of that stuff right here. Have you ever heard, I've been waiting forever? Yes. Have you ever said that? Yes. Was it true? No. What about this one? <laughs> well, I'm used to it. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. <laughs> You ever use that expression? <laughs> Hyperbole. How about this one? Why, everyone knows that. I know this one's going to get you. My feet are killing me. <laughs> really? Well, you're still here, so apparently they didn't do it. <laughs> that drive seemed like forever. I love you to the moon and back. <laughs> really? When's the last time you made that trip? 
our government's been trying for several weeks and months now to get a rocket that would just be a test of trying to get someone up there and back. Now, what about this one? Cry me a river. <laughs> These are examples of this hyperbole. It is a phrase, it is an expression that is very drastic, but it is said to make a point. I believe some of what Jesus says to us is to make a point. You cannot take it as a literal teaching. Let me give you a verse. If you, if you don't believe this, let's go back just a little further in Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to look at verse 29. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, let's stop for a minute. Has any one of you ever had your right eye to cause you to sin. Well, I get, I'm going to stand up here with my hand up. My left eye has played a role in it too. <laughs> now, how many of you's eyes have caused you to sin? Three or four of you. <laughs> I need to talk to those of you that didn't raise your hand. <laughs> All right, now let's see what the Lord says about that. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. I don't see a person in here this morning missing a right eye. If Jesus missed that, why have you still got your right eye? You see what I'm saying? Let's, let's read on. Read on. Pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body. Was Jesus teaching that people were supposed to pluck their eyes out? No. no. But he was saying it in such a way that people would understand the severity of sin's consequences. And the severity of sin's consequences, if not taken care of, is hellfire. And then eventually a lake of fire. That's a message for another day. The Apostle Paul also used this. I want you to go with me over to the book of Galatians. I want you to see this hyperbole. And I may be murdering that word, but you get my drift, right? In the book of Galatians, chapter number five, I believe it is. Make sure I'm in the right pew. Yes. No. Let me let me get to the right place. You bear with me just for a moment. So I want you to see this. Chapter 4, chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4. Had it marked, even had it underlined, still couldn't find it. The Apostle Paul uses this same concept. Listen, Galatians 4, verse 15. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? Paul writing to the church of Galatia. For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul says, if it were possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Do you think for one moment the, the Apostle Paul was expecting any member of the church of Galatia to pluck their eyes out and try to give them to him? No, no. It's a matter of speech to try to place strong emphasis on the point being taught. And I believe with all of my heart, this is what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, verse 39. Let me read you something uh, that our friend Jay Vernon says 
about this. J. Vernon says, do you live like this or do you resist evil? There is a principle for us here. But we are living in a day when a wise man is armed and keeping his house. Did J. Vernon wrong? I mean, if you look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, take a literal interpretation of it, you're probably going to be blind in one eye for sure. And uh, you're going to be a person that does not protect yourself. You're going to be a person that does not protect your home. You're going to be a person that doesn't see the need of protecting your nation, your country. In other words, you're going to be a person that says, come on, shoot me, I'm ready to die. Amen. Amen. Jesus is teaching us, I believe. I believe that he is teaching us that we do not intentionally return hurt for hurt. There are many things that happen to us on life's journey where we do not need to return hurt. I don't get it. You get it. Let, let, me, uh, let me give you an example. A story, and then I'm done for this morning, okay? A story. It's a story of two farmers. Let's have farmer number one and farmer number two. They're neighbors. Both of them have a pretty good cattle spread and acreage for those cattle to feed on. Well, <clears throat> farmer number one, his cows get out and they destroy some of farmer number two's fences, trample down his garden, <clears throat> no more tomatoes. Uh, just do all those sort of things that a normal loose animal would do to somebody else's property. Well, <clears throat> Farmer number two, he gets mad at his neighbor and he demands payment for which farmer number one gladly pays. Y'all with me in the story? Then as luck would have it, I believe we call it karma today, don't we? As luck would have it a few days later, number two, his cows get out and do damage to his neighbor. Number one. The difference is that farmer number one says nothing and will accept nothing from farmer number two. Later that night, the farmer goes to his friend and says, please take the money back. You have something I don't have and I want it. I want to find that kind of unselfish spirit and maybe this will help me get started. Amen. Amen. Don't return hurt for hurt and you will be surprised what good may come from it. Turn the other cheek. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that the things that have been said this morning are things that would honor you, things that will bring you glory, power, and honor. Fathers, we sing now this hymn of invitation. I pray that you speak to hearts. If there be one that is lost today, they'll be saved. If there be one that is saved and needs to recommit their life, this will be the time they'll do it. That one that you feel, that they feel you are leading them to become a member of this church in the way that we receive membership. I pray for them to come as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.